know, children that were basically having a blood test was either just not possible, so they'd go to the community nutrition and say, not going to have a blood, might influence our treatment, but we can't go there, it's too awful, or a major, major trauma and absolutely terrible. And really, those blood clinics, I think if you were in the building where blood clinics were going on now, you wouldn't know that we were, you know, there was a vampire in the room taking blood from children. Um, because actually, it's managed so well, both by very skilled nurses, but also by um, Charlotte's brilliant distraction techniques. Okay, I'm going to move on now to um, the work around um, palliative and end-of-life care, which is one aspect of what the team does and something that they do, I think, particularly well and something we should celebrate. Um, and just going back again, um, in 2008 there was um, a report looking into um, the improvement of palliative and end-of-life care for children a whole lot of local work done, and Mark, amongst others, was involved in this work, Marion. Um, and this allowed, um, enabled us to invest, or PCT at the time it was then, to invest <coughs> into the local, into our team, into the CCM team, to extend our service. And um, that's allowed, allowed us to operate seven days a week, which we were before, and to extend to 24-hour care. And there's obviously, there's obviously a huge amount of training and enabling that needs to happen to enable the team to do this, and I want to talk a bit more about that later on. But I think it's true to say that it has taken that on board and done it really, really well. And a couple of years ago, um, the team was um, recognised for this in the leading lights um, ceremonies. Um, just talking about end of life, we'll, we've got a couple of case examples in a minute. But Obviously, there is an enormous amount of clinical, skilled clinical work that the nurses need to do for the child. But actually, one of the things that I think the team really does brilliantly is the way they bring everything together for that child. And this is not an exhaustive list of people involved here, but there are often this and many, many more people involved in this child's care at this point in time, and obviously, time of huge stress. And Mary and the team always sort of bring that together to work for the family. And I think, I hope that the film will enable you to see that in action. <coughs> so I'm just going to describe two children um, at opposite ends of the age of spectrum. Um, one is um, Sophie. Um, now Sophie um, had something called San Felipe, which is a very um, problem, unkind, degenerative condition. And she um, got to age 19. She was in our care until um, this summer. Um, now, she was a young lady that, in her early years of life, would have had normal levels of activity and everything would have been expected to be, you know, she would have been able to move and so on. But as things went on, she deteriorated. She went to Breakspear School, which is one of our local schools, and received fantastic care, both from the school nurse, OT, physio. So, you know, this is a child who had many, many areas of HCT and other parts of the health and social care economy locally. Her life expectancy was 12 years, but Sophie was one of these children that if you were asked every year, would, could Sophie die this year, the answer would probably be yes, she could. And the family industry were living with that year on year on year. She went to Nascot Lawn a lot, which is our local um, short breaks provision for children with complex needs. And she needed a lot of help with uh, management of her um, seizures and uh, airway. And in the last year, um, Debbie Kelly was sitting over there, who was a, the transition coordinator, and her colleague Louisa Orlandi, um worked incredibly hard to make the transition for Sophie um, right. And this was terrifying for the family because, and it was particularly hard around the transition from Nascot Lawn because there isn't an adult equivalent in Nas to Nascot Lawn. Um, but Sophie became unwell during the summer and ended up in an um, AA uh, acute assessment unit at Watford General. And um, it was becoming obvious that she was actually approaching the end of her life. And really, um, it would have been so easy for Sophie just to have ended up in AAU and died there. That would have been such a, um, uh, a it would have been very likely had we not worked so hard to turn everything around and get her home. And Louisa did just that with the CCM team, the district nursing team, I can't <coughs> them all, everybody was involved. There was also a social care package that was looking after Sophie overnight. They were completely um, unfamiliar and quite terrified about things like the oxygen, the tubes and, and all the medication that Sophie was going home with. 
we managed to give all the clinical backup to allow those people that knew her well to carry on looking after her overnight, but with clinical support from all of us. And the outcome was that she did die at home with her brother and parents. And I think, you know, her mother summed up the situation to Debbie when she said um, that Louisa was the fair little terrier, making everything happen. And that is so true of how all, the, all of the nurses work in these circumstances. Um, Mary, do you want to talk through Jack? Who was three? Um, so <coughs> Jack um, came to our um, care from UCLH um, after a diagnosis of a brain tumour from Watford General. So he was transferred at Watford to UCLH, had started his treatment, but um, after the first lot of treatment, his symptoms became much worse. Um, his seizures were um, not every hour, er, many, many times during every hour. Um, there was a lot of discussion around um, surgery and removal of some of that tumour, but um, on the biopsy it looked like that it was a very actively growing tumour. Um, Jack had a very complicated family um, circumstances. Jack's mum and dad.